Okay, well, it's after seven, so go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Paul Nelson. I'm on the board of the Woodlands Green and your host for these, uh, the lecture series. And this is the 24, 25 season of the lectures. We have nine months of, of uh, talks, environmentally related talks. This is the first one of the season, September and uh, as has been our custom, we start off with this particular USGS report on the groundwater level. Altitudes is the study that's done once a year and has been done for uh, many, many years. I want to say first, I'm going to keep them, everyone, just for clarity's sake, everybody is muted and camera should be off. And we're going to do it that way throughout the, the conversation. I think this is a report. Jason is going to tell us about these issues. And I think that um, we're going to respond to questions and take comments, but I want it to be done in the chat. And at the end, we'll try to, to make sure everybody has their question or either a comment addressed. Also, um, before I get started with presentation tonight, I wanted to remind everybody that this is done by the Woodlands Green. And if you're new to that, if you enjoy this series and uh, talks like this, then just go to the woodlandsgreen.org website. There's a calendar there and a list of all the things that this group does for the environment and sustainability of the woodlands area. Uh, start with that. I also wanted to point out just a few things happening. The landscape solution is Saturday. That's a woodlands green. Uh, we'll have a booth there. It's a longstanding event. I find it one of the best of the year that the township puts on. Uh, the Woodlands Green will have a booth there to discuss invasive species. They'll be selling rain barrels at a discount. And uh, it's just a lot of booths there and a, a whole lot of learning going on about how to do landscape, natural species, et cetera. So I'd like you to do that. It's at the 6464 Creekside Forest at the Rec Center at Rog Fleming Park. Also, the next talk in our series is going to happen on October the 24th. Dr. Meredith Jennings of Hart Houston Area Research Center. Uh, we'll talk about heat islands. I don't know if you saw it in the Chronicle, but she was leading a study of the creation of heat islands in the Houston area and a big survey of that and how that affects our weather and everything else. And it also, she will talk about the, the importance of trees and shrubs, et cetera, and ground cover to prevent those things. So that's the 24th. And again, that'll be sent out via email and also on the calendar at woodlandsgreen.org. I think that's all I have on that. Um, again, Jason Ramage is with the USGS. He's a hydrologist, degree in geology. Um, he's been doing this for us for several years in a row. Uh, if you read the introduction, there are hundreds of wells that are in the, you know, from Galveston Island North that they monitor annually. Uh, and he'll explain exactly how that works. You know, that we shut the wells down as much as possible and try to get a good idea of where the water is in relation to the surface of the earth. Um, he's the, with the Texas or Oklahoma, Texas Water Science Center, which happens to be in the area and um, has been doing this for a long time. And he specializes in 
groundwater and compaction and subsidence, uh, as well as chemistry. So I think with further, no further, just again, if you would send in uh, a chat or put a question in there, and again, and Jason is going to, let's try to get done with the, the entire talk, and then we'll go back and ask questions and ask him to clarify things if need be. So Jason, appreciate you being here and uh, go ahead and go. All righty. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, here tonight. Uh, Paul's already done a, a great job uh, uh, inter introducing me, so I think I'll just jump right into it here. Um, so like Paul said, this is going to be a, a presentation on uh, groundwater level altitudes, as well as short-term and long-term water level changes uh, for the Gulf Coast Aquifer System here in the greater Houston region. Uh, we'll also be looking at some compaction and subsidence data uh, towards the end of, this, of the um, presentation. Um, this is research that is, has been going on now for, uh, we, well, we've been publishing these reports now for coming up on uh, close to 50 years, um, annual reports uh, on, on these uh, water level altitudes. Um, and it's research that's done in cooperation with several entities. You can see their, um, their badges here up in the, the top right of the, uh, the slide. Uh, we do this research in cooperation with Harris Galveston Subsidence District, as well as Fort Bend Subsidence District, City of Houston, Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District, and Brazoria County Groundwater Conservation District. There we go. Um, so just quickly, just an overview here of what uh, what we'll be covering uh, for the for the presentation. Uh, as I said, this is a 2024 water level map series. These are uh, we'll be looking at water level altitudes for the Chico and Evangeline aquifers undifferentiated, uh, as well as for the Jasper aquifer. Uh, for both of them, we'll also look at short term changes, uh, so one and five year water level changes. And then we'll look at some longer term uh, water level changes for these aquifers. And then, uh, and then, as I mentioned, we'll be looking at compaction data. So this, uh, this map on the right, these are, uh, these are the wells in which we collect data across the, the, the region. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we uh, get into the next couple of slides. Um, but before we look at the data, just a, a kind of a quick overview, just to kind of set the stage for um, uh, for the hydrology, geology, hydrology of the area. Um, this uh, figure that we're looking at here, this is a cross-sectional figure of uh, the Gulf Coast aquifer system in our region. So this, uh, you can kind of see in the inset map here, this cross-section uh, cuts through Grimes County, a small portion of Montgomery County, uh, down through Harris and Galveston counties in this down dip direction. Um, for those of you that are interested, the, 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 the numbered symbols here uh, are represented by the vertical lines in the, in the cross section, and these are some of the, some of the wells in which we're used to uh, uh, determine or delineate the, the aquifer boundaries, so those tops and the bases of those aquifers. Um, uh, so these are, um, uh, these are sediments which are tertiary and, and, and quaternary in age. Uh, so have been accreting these uh, sedimentary wedges now for, for quite a long time. Um, so starting with the, uh, the oldest uh, system within the, the Gulf Coast Aquifer system, uh, the oldest and more, most deeply buried is the Catahoula Confining System here. Um, we call that a confining system, although there are uh, some sandier part portions of the system which uh, are used for uh, some uh, water production. Uh, we, we, we do know of some wells in Montgomery County which are producing water out of the Catahoula. And then as we get kind of further further north and up dip, uh, we see more Catahoula wells. Although for the purposes of the report that we're producing annually and, and this um, presentation, uh, we're, not, we're not really looking at those data, uh, relatively limited data in the Catahoula or wells uh, screened in the Catahoula. So above that is the Jasper Aquifer. So that's represented here in this, this green shade. And then, uh, and then above that is the Burkeville Confining Unit. So this is a 
a, a thick layer of fine grain sediments, uh, which trans or, or, or which uh, separates the hydraulic heads of the Jasper from the overlying Chico and Evangeline that we see uh, here. Um, so they, they, it is a transmissive barrier between the two. Um, so I think that uh, just kind of a brief overview of uh, the aquifer systems here. For the purposes of, of this report and this annual effort, um, we are now combining the data from the Chico and Evangeline aquifers. And so it's, we call that, uh, again, for the purposes of this report and presentation, uh, the Chico and Evangeline uh, aquifer undifferentiated. And then just a few points about our network. Um, so we are, we are measuring um, water levels in wells across an 11 county area. So that includes uh, Harris County, as well as all adjacent counties. We've got just a few in Grimes, a few in, in Waller, uh, or excuse me, Walker County, and then a few in San Jacinto County. Um, data are collected uh, for this year. Data be began in uh, early December, so December 12th of 2023 and we collected those data through uh, the early part of March, uh, ending March 7th, uh, 2024. And we collect our data during that, uh, roughly that same time period each year. Usually this is kind of when um, there's least demand on the system, or the least demand for, for water uh, uh, and less stress on the aquifer system. So we get as close as we can to sort of static conditions uh, in the aquifers. Um, the majority of these well types are public supply, they're municipal supply, and so uh, we rely pretty heavily on um, uh, municipal supply operators and, and owners and operators to, to uh, gain access to, to collect data in these wells. Um, as Paul mentioned, we do our best to uh, try to have that well off for as long as possible, usually a minimum of you know, 45 minutes or an hour um, or longer if possible. Uh, before we collect our data. Uh, we make multiple measurements to, to verify those data. Um, and then uh, aside from the public supply and municipal supply wells, we're also collecting, collecting data in uh, irrigation, industrial, and some observation wells. So for this year, uh, for the 2024 year, again, that's uh, December of 2023 through March of 2024, um, for the Chico and Evangeline undifferentiated, we collected 478 water level measurements. Uh, for the Jasper, we collected 88 water level measurements. And then to produce the maps that we'll see in the upcoming slides, um, we use 444 of those measurements to produce the Chico and Evangeline water level altitude uh, for 2024, and then 84 measurements to, uh, to produce the uh, water level altitude for the Jasper. So just to give some uh, a little bit of background on uh, the methods, so uh, how we collect our data and the spatial distribution there of the data. So with that, we'll, we'll get right into the, to, to the maps, the, the, our first map. This is gonna be uh, the water level altitude for the Chico and Evangeline undifferentiated for 2024. So, uh, so these are uh, water level altitudes and uh, so the way we uh, the way we produce these maps is uh, we go out and we collect our data or we make our water level measurements and then we reference them all from the same data plane datum plane and so in that case in this case we're using the datum of NABD 88 so kind of imagine um, uh, you know from so sort of sea level or, or from the coast if you were to project uh, a flat plane uh, from sea level uh, inward or landward, we're looking at water levels which are either below that datum, that plane, that projected plane, or above that datum. Uh, so in this case, uh, where we're seeing sort of the, the warmer colors, the yellows and the reds, these are water levels below that datum. And then the blue uh, cooler colors are water levels above that datum. And so really across uh, most of the study region, we can see that uh, most water levels are below that, that projected plane of that datum, that NABD 88 datum. Um, so the shading, uh, shading color, colors here are increments of 50 feet. Um, and so we can kind of see that uh, sort of in the western, central western part of Harris County, we see a pretty 
uh, a fairly large area of deep water level altitudes here of uh, more than 250 feet uh, below that NAVD 88 datum. There's also another area in uh, south central Montgomery County and, and some portions of north central Harris County up here where we also see again these water level altitudes of uh, as much as and, and more than 250 feet uh, below that NAVD 88 datum. Um, but, you know, as to a lesser degree, we, again, we see across most of the study region, you know, most of Harris County, uh, uh, Galveston County, down into uh, Brazoria, Fort Bend, et cetera, we, we still see these water level altitudes uh, below that NAVD 88 datum. Um, so I talked about that, that projected plane from, uh, from, uh, from sea level. Um, just, just to kind of help orient a little bit here, I'm trying to hopefully you all can kind of see this. I'm just tracing this sort of zero line or this inflection point between positive and negative uh, water level altitudes. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, along that line, water level altitudes would be approximately equal to uh, that um, essentially sea level. And then as we start moving uh, away, sort of in, in toward the west and the north and the up dip, uh, areas of the study areas where we start seeing positive water level altitudes above that datum. Um, in, in a very, very small portion uh, in Grimes County, hopefully, uh, again, you can all see my pointer here. Uh, we have one data, data point uh, or one well which showed uh, more than 150 feet above, uh, above the NABD 88. Um, and then a, a, a slightly larger area in the same um, general vicinity. Uh, parts of Grimes County, a small sliver of Montgomery County and uh, Walter County, where we see uh, water level altitudes approximately 100 to 150 feet there, and then two small isolated areas out in um, uh, San Jacinto County, where we see, again, uh, approximately 100 to 150 feet above datum. Uh, we do have, uh, I will point out, though, we do have uh, you know, more sparse data points as we get out toward these areas than we do uh, in the rest of the study area. And so, yeah, so each of these little small uh, symbols here, these dots, these are each of the wells that we've collected data in for the Chico and Evangeline. Okay, so that gives sort of a snapshot uh, uh, of uh, static conditions within the Chico and Evangeline aquifer. So if we look at, uh, so now we're going to look at uh, one year or these short-term water level changes. So these are one-year changes. And these are changes where we've measured data in wells both in 2023 and in 2024. And so we've just done a direct comparison uh, between those, those uh, uh, measured values um, and rounded them to the nearest foot. And so uh, for this year, we had 416 water level measurement pairs uh, between 2023 and 2024. Um, and the, uh, the symbology here, the downward facing triangles represents a decline since 2023, whereas the upward facing triangles uh, represent a water level rise since 2023. And in a few cases, <clears throat> in a few cases, we had essentially no change. Uh, those are represented by these um, small gray uh, circles here. So we see a few of those down in parts of Fort Bend and Brazoria and Galveston County. Um, but by and large, uh, the, the vast majority of these symbols are downward facing triangles with varying shades of red indicating the magnitude of decline over the past year. Um, and kind of in general, you know, I kind of look at 59 here um, as something of a dividing line. So sort of tracing 59 as we look kind of south, uh, south and east of that uh, Highway 59, um, we see, again, primarily declines, but those declines are relatively small, sort of in that one to 10 foot range for the most part. Um, but as we get into uh, western and southwestern parts of Harris County, uh, northern Fort Bend County, as well as parts of uh, southern Montgomery County, uh, we start seeing some larger declines over that one year period. Um, and as I state here, kind of in the, in the uh, text, on the left-hand side of the, the, the pane, uh, a little more than half or about 52 to 53 percent are, are declines in that one to 10 foot range, which is typical for what we see for uh, for the one year period. We do see, we do tend to see 
changes either in decline or pause uh, or, or uh, rise in that one to 10 foot range for the most part. Uh, but again, we do see uh, quite a few, some of the, uh, the largest declines, we've got uh, several wells here with more than 50 feet of decline in Western Harris County. Uh, this is sort of Beltway 8 here and I-10. Uh, and then we had one in Fort Bend County, which showed a pretty significant decline of uh, also more than 50 feet. Um, and then we had one in Fort Bend here, which showed uh, more than a 40 foot of rise. And for folks who are uh, like to see things uh, a little bit more graphically, it shows the same data, but in a, in a more graphical way. So here's our zero change line. So everything on, on this side is represented as a water level rise and everything to the left is represented as a water level decline. So again, as I mentioned, you know, most of them are occurring in this one to 10 foot range. So a little bit more than half, um, but about 24% were uh, declines of 10 to 20 feet. Um, so again, we had primarily declines for the previous year. Uh, some of which were fairly significant. So we'll compare that to five-year water level changes. Uh, these are five-year changes in the um, Chico Evangeline uh, since 2019. So again, same thing. We just uh, every every well in which we collected data in 2019 and 2024. Direct comparison between those two years, we had 385 water level measurement pairs, um, and similar pattern. Uh, you know, by and large, the vast majority are water level declines, which again, we can see same symbology here. We see lots of downward facing uh, uh, sort of red red shaded triangles indicating declines, with just a few, um, uh, a few water level rises, uh, most of those being relatively low, you know, in that one to 10 foot range. Um, and again, I think, you know, most of the largest declines we're seeing in Western Harris and Southwest Harris County here, portions of uh, Fort Bend County and quite a few in Southern Montgomery County. So I think these are, you know, um, and, and I think similar to what we'll see in the upcoming slides, I think these uh, um, these declines are reflective of demand and, and, and areas of growth. Um, so, and again, for folks who like to look at um, uh, data a little bit more graphically, uh, similar to what we saw previously, this is our uh, zero change line and, um, you know, less than sort of less than 10% or so, eight or 10% uh, were of these water level measurement pairs were represented as water level rises. Whereas uh, the majority again, are you know, so sort of the last 88 or 90% uh, are water level declines. And, and, it, and you can kind of see, you know, roughly eight or so percent uh, of those were declines of more than 50 feet over that five-year period. So, uh, so moving on, so we've looked at those short-term changes. Now we're going to be looking at the, the longer-term changes. And so these are um, water level changes since 1990 for the Chico and Evangeline. Um, and so the blue colors, they represent water level rises. Whereas the, the warmer yellows and reds, these represent water level declines. And so, uh, and, and just to point out that these shadings are uh, 40 foot increments. And so really across most of, uh, kind of most of Harris County, uh, particularly around central Harris County, um, but even down into the Eastern parts of Harris and down into um, Galveston and, and portions of uh, Brazoria and Fort Bend County, uh, we see water level rises since that time period. Um, so this this area, this relatively large area here, uh, covering um, a good portion of central Harris County, uh, those are rises uh, in excess of 120 feet uh, since that time period. But then as we start sort of moving out, I think you know here I kind of look, I typically look at sort of Highway Six, uh, which uh, I don't think is entirely represented across. Um, this area entirely, but uh, roughly around Highway 6, as we start moving west and north of that is where we start seeing uh, primarily water level declines. And so we see that there are um, declines all across toward the west and north of central Harris County and, and, and uh, so down into Fort Bend County, but we see kind of three areas, uh, Fort Bend County right at the intersection of, the, of Harris, Fort Bend, and um, 
uh, water counties. We can see a fairly large area here of decline in that sort of 200 to 240 feet, uh, as well as out into Northwest Harris County here, and then a large area here <clears throat> in South Central Montgomery County with a very small area uh, in Montgomery County here of uh, more than 240 feet of decline. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I think these are sort of reflective of where, uh, you know, demand and growth has, has been occurring in those areas where we're seeing a lot of the declines. And then compare that with long-term changes uh, since 1977. Um, again, blues are rises, yellows and reds are declines. Pretty similar pattern, although shifted a bit. Um, we see that across, uh, again, most of central eastern Harris County is where we're seeing uh, the, the greatest amount of water level rise. Uh, there's an area sort of between, you know, downtown Houston and Pasadena. There's a very small area here where we see just a little bit uh, um, uh, over 200 feet of rise, and then a larger area of about 160 to 200 feet of rise. Uh, and then again, I think here, Bellway 8 does a, a pretty good uh, job of delineating that change from rises to declines. Uh, and then same kind of areas that we saw in the previous map. Uh, we're seeing some larger areas of water level declines out in you know, Western Harris County, North, Northwest Harris County, uh, Northern Harris County, and, and Southern Montgomery County. Um, some of these areas are in excess of, um, uh, particularly in Southern Montgomery County, we see more than 360 feet uh, of decline uh, in our data there. So, so uh, quite a lot of, of variation in, in, uh, in rises and declines, but, but again, by and large, we see for both 1990 and 1977, you know, central eastern Harris County, we see lots of rises, western, uh, northwest, and northern Harris County and southern Montgomery County are where we're seeing those declines. So, uh, so that, uh, that really kind of covers the Chico and Evangeline uh, data. Uh, so we'll move into the uh, Jasper here. And so this is the water level altitude for uh, for the Jasper for 2024. And so again, uh, these are water levels which are above or below that NABD 88 plane. Um, blues are, the, the cooler colors and blues are, are water level altitudes above that plane. And so we can kind of see in the up dip portions here, Parts of uh, Northwest Montgomery County, parts of Grimes County, we see um, 250, almost 300 feet of uh, water level altitude above in ABD 88. Um, these are 50 foot, uh, these are shaded increments of 50 feet. But as we start to move in the down dip uh, direction toward the coast, uh, we start seeing those water, water level altitudes uh, there's a general trend of declining water level altitudes in that direction, uh, with the deepest altitudes being in South Central Montgomery County, as well as uh, a portion of uh, North Central Harris County here. Uh, so those altitudes are, are a little bit more than 250 feet uh, below NABDA data. All right. Uh, so, so moving on from the altitude, now we're looking at the one-year changes. So just like what we saw for the Chiclin Evangeline, uh, almost all of these are represented as water level declines over the, the one-year period. Uh, in fact, uh, about about 88 percent, and again, that's similar to, there. it's on par or similar to what we saw for the Chico Evangeline, uh, about 88 percent of these water level measurement pairs were, um, were declines. And about 75% of those were in the one to 20 foot, um, uh, one to 20 feet of decline. Um, we do have uh, a few relatively large uh, declines over this period of more than 30 feet. We've got a couple here in South Central Montgomery County, uh, one here in kind of the central part of, of the county near uh, near the lake. And then we have, uh, we did have one relatively large rise of more than 30 feet uh, here in uh, South Central Montgomery County. And then another one along the border of Grimes and uh, uh, Montgomery County here. Uh, but again, almost all declines. And graphically, if, if you prefer that, um, we see that just a few really were represented as rises, uh, whereas the majority, again, like I said, roughly about 75% 
uh, were declines, and those were in the you know, 40, about 42 percent were in the one to 10 foot range, and 33 percent in that 10 to 20 foot range. And now looking at the five year water level changes, um, these are water level changes for the Jasper since 2019. We had 62 water level measurement pairs, almost all declines, and we can see uh, the dark shaded red symbols here represent uh, uh, declines of more than 50 feet, which we had uh, uh, quite a few. Uh, as we can see that across a large part of, uh, really a, a large part of this, the, the South Central Montgomery County and Central Montgomery County, we see a lot of those occurring there um, with uh, really only two rises, uh, one of which was fairly significant again, that well uh, near the border or at the border there of Grimes and uh, Montgomery County. Uh, and then just again, sort of showing this in a, a different uh, view. We can, again, we can see that, um, you know, there was quite a few, uh, let's see, 20, you know, 45 or, or so percent or 40 percent or so were more than uh, 50 feet of decline. So we, we see quite a few of these uh, with significant amount of decline over that five year period. And then looking at long term change. Um, in the Jasper, this is long-term change since 2000. Um, and, and again, similar uh, or, or same symbology here. We got, we, we've got just a, a slight sliver of uh, a, a blue shaded region and the most up dip uh, portion of, uh, of the Jasper here, and uh, which represents just a little bit more than 20 feet of rise. And then one more small sliver of um, uh, of blue here, which is uh, up to 20 feet of rise, but uh, by almost all of the rest of the um, the mapped area here shows a decline in water level since 2000. Uh, so these are 20 foot uh, shades of 20 foot increments. And as we again, like we saw for the altitude, water level altitude, that you know as we move in the down dip direction, uh, we start seeing uh, a, a, a steep decline in uh, water level ch uh, changes. Um, the lowest of which uh, we've got more than 260 feet of decline in a small area here of uh, Harris County. We've got fairly limited data here, but of those of those data, we, we, we've seen uh, pretty significant declines. Um, we've got more data here in the southern part of Montgomery County uh, and with a, a fairly large area of uh, 220 to 240 feet of decline over that period. So, so again, some, so since that period, seen, we've seen a, a quite a bit of decline uh, in the Jasper. Um, and I forgot, let me go back. Let's see. I, wanted to, I just wanted to also point out, because I'll, I'll bring this up a little bit later. Um, ah, here we go. For the altitude, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, we, I, I didn't, we didn't uh, shade them. Um, we didn't extend the shading to them, but we have two Jasper wells, uh, one of which is kind of at the southern uh, end of Lake Houston. Hopefully you all can see that with my pointer here. Um, it is a monitoring uh, well that, that, uh, that we've been monitoring now for quite a long time, um, but that the altitude in that well was uh, 34 feet below datum. And then we, did, we do have a fairly new well, production well, uh, which was drilled in uh, as far south as um, uh, Fort Bend County in Cinco Mud, um, and uh, it is off the map, so it is further down off the map here um, in Montgomery, or excuse me, Fort Bend County. Uh, we had 36.9 feet above NABD8 datum uh, at that well. Um, anyway, I just wanted to kind of point that out since I think I forgot to mention that uh, when I was on this slide. Um, so that covers the, uh, that essentially covers the water level data uh, for the region, for, for Chico and Evangeline and Jasper. And then the, the, the last few slides here really are, um, uh, uh, are about compaction and subsidence. Um, so I've got a, a number of things to point out here, and, and, um, and I might, maybe I should start off really with uh, explaining how we get this, this data. Um, each of these uh, each of these symbols on the map here represents an extensometer. Um, and an extensometer is uh, essentially like, uh, just to simplify it, essentially like a deep seated uh, benchmark. Um, think of it, you know, just kind of think of it like a benchmark, which is anchored at depth. 
And so each one of these uh, is anchored at a specific depth, uh, usually at or near the, um, the base of uh, either the Chico or the Evangelion Aquifer. Um, and in some cases, it, it may be above, above that base, um, but, but most of them are close to the base of one of the two aquifers. Um, and so essentially what we do is, is, is measure, um, continuously measure data, uh, uh, land, or small scale changes in land surface elevation relative to what would be that uh, essentially stable uh, benchmark, which is anchored at depth. So, so just think of it like a benchmark and we're measuring the land surface changes around that stable benchmark. Um, and uh, so for each of these excentometers on the left hand, uh, the left hand side here, um, we've got uh, a year associated with each one and that's the year in which these uh, excentometers were installed and established and began recording data. And so we've been recording data, for instance, at our Baytown shallow site since 1973 continuously. Um, and then similarly for Clear Lake since 1976, uh, and then several of them were installed in 1980. So, uh, so the majority, with the exception of our Cinco Mud, were all have all been recording data since uh, the mid 1970s through early uh, 1980 or, or 1980. Uh, Cinco Mud in Fort Bend County is our newest uh, extensometer. Has been recording data there since 2017. Uh, we also have uh, one in Texas City, which is Galveston County, but uh, the rest of them are all uh, just covered in uh, Harris County here. Uh, so for each of these exensometers, the number here uh, represents the cumulative amount of compaction recorded at that site. And so I'm, and I am sort of distinguishing between compaction and subsidence here. We're talking about uh, in this slide compaction. Um, but I, I always like to distinguish the two by saying that um, compaction is the mechanism by which we get subsidence or the surface expression of the lowering of land surface elevation. Um, so we saw that uh, at, that cross section uh, at the at the at the beginning of the presentation, and it's it's um, it's sort of a simplified cross section. Uh, most of the uh, aquifers or the aquifers are primarily made up of coarser grain materials, so, so sort of gravels and sands, but interbedded by a significant amount of uh, finer grain sediments like clays and silts. And so, uh, so as water levels over time are, 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 are drawn down, uh, those um, sediments are being dewatered and in particular depressured. Um, and so in particular, the finer grain sediments uh, those those clays and those uh, those silts, they lose once you once you depressure dewater and depressure those sediments, they lose their ability to to support that skeletal matrix, and so they actually because of those grains tend to be irregular in shape, they tend to flatten out, and so we actually lose volume of those fine grained sediments within the aquifers, and so it's the accumulation of of the loss of that volume which results in the surface expression of subsidence. Um, so to go back to our, our, our data here, uh, since the period in which each of these extensometers has been installed, uh, the year uh, listed to the left, uh, the cumulative amount of compaction which has been measured in feet uh, is next to each of the um, uh, each of the names of the extensometers. And uh, the size of the symbol here, just to help give some visual perspective, is representative of that amount of compaction. So. Uh, so, for instance, at, at our Attic Exensometer, which is near I-10 and, and Bellway 8 uh, West, um, we've measured 3.883 feet of compaction um, uh, since its establishment in 1974 through December of 2023. Uh, so that this is the site in which we've recorded the most amount of compaction um, uh, in comparison to the rest of the exensometers. Um, and then uh, conversely, at Texas City, um, since its establishment in 1973, we've recorded 0 0.103 feet of compaction at that location. So, um, and then, you know, Cinco Mud, we've only been recording data there for the last several years, but 0 0.038 feet. So just to kind of give a range uh, of, of, uh, of how much compaction has been recorded at each of these sites. Um, 
And, and, and just to also point out that, as I mentioned, each of these excentometers are anchored at a specific depth. And so what we're really, we're measuring the compaction of those sediments within the depth of, of land surface and that anchor depth. Um, so the blue symbols here are representative of excentometers measuring compaction within the Chico. Um, but we also have excentometers which are which penetrate both uh, units, so the Chico and, and Evangeline. And so we're measuring compaction within those two, uh, both, both of those aquifers. Um, what's not really shown here is uh, the long-term trend. And, and I should include that as a slide, um, but, uh, but it, it is important to mention, I think that um, some of these numbers are, are, are large, like particularly addicts, we see that, and, and um, one down at sort of NASA or Johnson Space Center, uh, two and a half, more than two and a half feet there. So we see some fairly large numbers of, of compaction. And again, that's since their inception, um, or since we've been recording data there, um, but if you look at the long-term trend, uh, most of that compaction, uh, at least since we've been recording it, has occurred uh, early in, you know, earlier in the period. So from, you know, early 70s through the early 80s or so, roughly. And then after that, um, groundwater reduction plans went into place uh, across much of Harris County. And we saw a, a, a significant drop in the rates of compactions at these, uh, compaction at these exensometers. Um, and uh, so again, we see uh, some fairly large numbers. The majority of that has occurred um, prior to uh, most of the regulations in the area. Um, and again, one, one more thing I should probably put in here that I don't have are the regulatory areas specific to Harris County. Um, and one of the reasons that we see significant amount of uh, uh, compaction at Addicts is because this is this exensometer exists within uh, what they call regulatory area three. Uh, and if I remember right, I, I don't think they uh, began their groundwater reduction plans in that area until about 2010. Um, whereas uh, in, the, in, in the rest of Harris County, uh, those areas, uh, they have regulatory area two and regulatory area one. Those have been, uh, those areas have been under regulatory plan, plans now for uh, many years. And so, um, so we see less overall compaction in those areas. Now, what the other thing that what the, this doesn't show is also the amount of compaction of, and subsidence that has occurred prior to the establishment of these exensometers. Um, I would say if you're interested in that, we uh, we published a, a report. Uh, if, you, uh, if you type in, um, if you Google Gulf model USGS, um, there's a lot of really great information. John Ellis was the, the, the um, primary author on that. He's, he's no longer with the USGS, <clears throat> but it is an incredible resource. There's a lot of really great historical information on subsidence and water level data, uh, uh, in particular, you know, prior to what we're considering here for this annual effort and this, this presentation and report, but uh, really interesting stuff. So if you have an interest in that, I think you know, that would be a great resource. Um, and then, uh, so for this slide, what I'm showing here is the amount of compaction that occurred between uh, December of 2022 and December of 2023, so that one year period. Um, and so we saw compaction at all of our sites, all of our uh, monitoring sites that range from uh, really no change through as much as uh, 0.078 feet, which occurred at our northeast exensometer here. But we had a, a again, we had a a range of data. Um, the largest, uh, the this is. I just realized this is this number is incorrect here. Uh, this is the total cumulative compaction value uh, for Johnson Space Center. Um, but uh, what I wanted to point out was that the largest uh, changes for the year occurred at Southwest, Attics, Northeast, Lake Houston, and Baytown. Uh, so sort of the northern half of Central Harris County. And then, you know, further to the south, we start seeing uh, less um, less compaction at these exensometers. Um, so, yeah, so I think that kind of covers all of the water level data and compaction data for for this year's annual report. Um, and I think I did this last year when I when I presented 
had uh, just a few, uh, three more slides here quickly on water level data. We've got, um, uh, so, so all the data that we had been looking at were uh, discrete data that had been measured once per year, you know, over uh, a period of, you know, whatever the period of years were. Um, but we've got, we do have some monitoring wells, monitoring, we call them plasmeters, um, which are uh, instrumented with real time uh, sensors that monitor water levels in them. Um, uh, various intervals, I think most of them are either 30 minute or one hour intervals. And so what I've done was uh, taken a daily average and plotted those uh, here for the previous um, a little bit more than five years since January of 2019 um, through uh, up through now, basically. Um, and so we've got a well, and I pointed this out when I went back to the Jasper uh, water level altitude. I pointed this well out. This is our monitoring well um, at the south end of Lake Houston. It is a Jasper well. It's in the upper part of the of the Jasper, um, and this well is uh, almost 2,600 feet deep. Um, but what we see is what we've seen over the period since January of 2019 is approximately a 20 foot decline in that water level. And this is just a monitoring piezometer. It's not a production well or anything. Um, and years ago, this well was artesian above land surface. It, it um, I mean, many years ago, um, yeah, long before my time, but but it was uh, from what I had been from what I've read and what I've been told by others is is that this this well was artesian above land surface 20 you know 20 30 40 feet above land surface um, but we're now uh, sitting at around 95 feet below land surface and then uh, we've got another one uh, right at um, sort of i-45 and 242 here in montgomery county um, another one of our uh, monitoring wells again also um, monitoring real-time water levels uh, it's an evangeline. Uh, this well is screened in evangeline at about uh, just over 800 feet. Um, we see a bit more of a seasonality uh, pattern to this water level data. Uh, but again, since January of 2019, this well has shown uh, about a 57 foot decline. So again, we see this sort of seasonality pattern, but uh, but beginning at about 325 feet and, and ending here at about 380 feet. So nearly a 60 foot decline over that five year period. Um, and then one more monitoring well here, uh, which is in the New Caney area. It's a, a shallower well in the Chico, um, uh, screened at about 600 feet. Similar kind of seasonality pattern that we see here, but uh, about a 25 foot decline, uh, starting at about 130 feet below land surface to about 150 to 155 feet. Um, so I think I showed these last year, and I just thought it'd be interesting to throw these up here again. Um, uh, for monitoring wells, uh, there's some fairly significant declines over the period. So, um, so anyway, with that, I think I'll I'll uh, I'll wrap it up. And um, I think do we want to do the the questions now, or yeah, I'm not sure if you can see them, but I would start. I think the first question we had was about the tools that are used to measure this. Uh, and whether that's, uh, well, I, I would assume that no matter what the tool is, you don't use the same one for 400 wells. So if yeah. you go into how it's, how it's done. Yeah, so uh, the majority of them are done using a steel tape. Um, I mean, it's sort of like an oversized, uh, you know, measuring tape kind of. It's on a reel. Uh, it's spring steel. They're stamped every foot. Um, the 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 lowest um, sort of 20 feet are stamped to every hundredth, hundredth of a foot. Um, and so we, uh, we use that steel tape and we put it in the well and, uh, and we use uh, a chalk line. And uh, it's really kind of an estimate. I mean, we just sort of estimate where we think that water level is going to be based on previous data. So we, you know, um, you know, previous year, a well might have been, you know, water surface was at 320 feet. So we might say, well, it's been a long, you know, hard summer. We're going to put in 340 feet of tape, uh, use that chalk and see if, uh, see where that chalk is, is cleaned off by the water surface. Uh, and then from there, we can, we can tell what the uh, depth to water is. So, um, so we use these steel tapes. Um, no, we don't use the same one in every well. We have a number of them. 
um, and uh, and we make multiple measurements uh, to to verify. Um, we make at least two, sometimes more than that, uh, where necessary to help verify uh, the readings that we're getting. Um, and uh, and those instruments are they go through a sort of calibration process uh, at a uh, USGS facility that handles um, uh, handles data or, or excuse me ha handles instrumentation and they they handle all the calibration of uh, most of our instrumentation so um, so yeah that's how we that's how we collect those data in some cases um, where we can't use the steel tapes for various reasons um, some wells will have a an airline attached to them so it's essentially like a, a um, eighth-inch copper tube, usually copper tube, which is um, strapped to the standpipe of the well. Um, it usually goes down to the approximately the depth of the pump impellers. Um, and so we, what we'll do is we'll calibrate uh, a pressure reading. We can put a, we'll, we'll put a pressure gauge on that airline tube. We'll pressure it up with, with uh, air pressure, usually nitrogen, and we'll get a reading and we'll calibrate that reading to an actual tape down with our steel tapes. Um, and then what we can do is, is uh, if for whatever reason in, in the future we can't use our steel tapes, we'll use that airline. Um, but we'll give it a larger error, uh, you know, we'll, we'll assign it a larger error or uncertainty estimate. Um, uh, it's just generally less accurate than the, uh, the steel tapes. Okay. Um, I do more. see that I did open up the chat here, so I think I can read them. Um, yeah, I think, well, I was going to ask the ones I had in front of me that... Uh -huh. um, then there's the one that, if you look at it, is more complex about. But uh, one of the questions was the level rises associated with the same wells. Are they no longer being used? I mean, assuming that the less they're used, the more they rise over time. Or are they no longer being? Um, um, so where we're seeing, primarily where we're seeing rises, so, so really, again, in those areas which are, are, are being um, effectively regulated, uh, they're under a groundwater reduction plan. And so they may still be used, but they're not used as frequently um, as they might have been in the past. Um, a, really a, a large, a, a significant portion of water that's supplied to the region is, is supplied through surface water now and other, other alternative water sources. Um, so, sort of the mid 70s was really sort of the peak of when groundwater was uh, the primary water. Um, groundwater was a source of, of the primary source of water. Um, but since then, uh, more and more water has been uh, supplied from surface water sources. So, so, um, so yeah, so we've seen it's not that they're not necessarily not used. Some, some are not used anymore or very rarely, or and in, in those cases, um, they might be, uh, you know, municipals, they may hold on to those wells, um, keep them in, in minimal operation for emergency backup purposes and so forth. Um, or, or they just, they, they may be in operation, they just aren't used quite as much as they maybe had been in the past. You also followed up that with how to explain the significant rises very close to the wells that are showing significant declines. And I, I'm just guessing, I'm not sure how far some of these triangles are apart. I mean, it, uh, you've crowded a bunch of them on a small map, so yeah. Um, how would you explain that you'd have one just down the road, for instance, that was uh, rebounding, but next to one that was declining? Yeah, and it, it, and it can be hard to answer that question because we don't really, we don't always know what sort of antecedent pumping status or conditions were. You know, like I said, we, we will try and, I mean, we will ask to have those wells off, you know, really for as long as we can, but we also don't know if, say, for instance, that well had been pumping for three days straight uh, or something to that effect, or if for whatever reason they have, you know, I, I've seen instances where they just have electrical problems and so that a particular well is down for, you know, maybe for a long period of time, um, and in which case there might be another well. Uh, potentially maybe another well nearby, which is making up for the fact that that well is down. So, so there could be, you know, a number of different reasons why that may happen. I think, you know, in the short term, uh, I think it's more important to keep, uh, you know, focus more on the longer term trends than the short term 
um, water level changes. Uh, although they they are interesting and they do kind of tell the story, you, you know, I think what we're seeing in the one in five year changes is similar to what we've seen in the last few years, particularly with um, the summers that we've had. We I mean, we've just had some pretty brutal summer summers. Um, and uh, so I think in general that that led to uh, a little bit more demand on the aquifer system than, you know, previous uh, than maybe in previous years. Right. That was that was certainly something that we saw in uh, especially in 2011, a big drought of 2011. I mean, there was just a, a much more massive demand on on groundwater at that time. So, um, so it's not unusual to see that kind of thing. But again, in terms of why we see uh, a few, you know, and there are a few of those instances where we see very close together um, wells, which might be, you know, one was rise and the other was a decline. Um, but uh, but there could be various reasons for that, like I like I mentioned, but. Well, the question is, what's the difference between groundwater altitude and groundwater elevation? Um, so in so for the for, so for this report and this presentation, we looked at water level altitudes and water level changes. Um, so the water level altitude, so you know, when we collect our data, we're measuring that depth to water in the well, essentially from land surface. Um, but of course, there there are variations in elevation of the land surface, uh, and so to, we, we, and so to make the data all comparable, we convert those into what we call an altitude, and so we reference that uh, water level measurement from uh, the, all the same datum, which is that NABD88 datum. Um, so essentially, you think about that as sea level. Uh, so if we reference all of our measurements to sea level, then they all become, they're all referenced from the same datum and they all become um, uh, comparable. Uh, whereas, you know, if, for instance, we measured the depth to the water in a well down in Galveston and it was uh, 50 feet below land surface, it wouldn't really be quite the same thing as 50 feet below land surface in, you know, northern Montgomery County where land surface elevations are uh, you know, 250, 300 feet above sea level, uh, as opposed to down in Galveston, you're basically at sea level. Um, okay. So again, that's, we, that's why we convert. So that's with an altitude is a water level, water level altitude is a water level reference from uh, a particular datum plane. We're using NABD 88. Okay. I don't know if you have a second and can uh, the find a rather lengthy question about the uh, undifferentiated. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, so, cheek and evangelion aquifers are undifferentiated. Is this everywhere, or are both aquifers connected at varying amounts depending on location? Asking the sediment logs, can they show trust the character? Sands, humans, but not each other. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and so I, I do want to point out that we're doing it for the purposes of these annual assessments. So, these regional scale annual assessments. Um, there would be other uh, uh, applications where you might want to consider them as separate. And like, for instance, the, the, I mentioned that Gulf model report, um, they, were, they were modeled separately. So it's separate aquifer units. So, so yes, they, they, they certainly can um, be different at, at different parts of the study area here. So, I mean, you, um, they may be, uh, as you, I mean, I think you said it well that that the uh, that the aquifers are maybe may or may not be connected at varying various amounts, you know, depending on spatial location. Um, and so I think, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think you there 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 is a significant amount more uh, significantly more clay. Um, uh, within the sediments, like for instance, uh, you know, closer that you get down towards the coast, so southern Harris, uh, southern Harris County and Galveston County, you're going to see maybe more differences in them than, say, like Fort Bend County, where um, uh, there may be less clay, for instance, in those areas. Um, so, so yeah, they can be uh, in in some applications. Yes, you would want to consider them separately. Okay, I had a question about whether or not if we didn't have human influence, in other words, don't pump them, would you expect all these 
everything that you're looking at today pretty much to remain the same. They don't just go up and down with the tides or anything, at least not significantly. Um, I mean, yeah, I would say uh, that the changes are reflective of uh, primarily of demand. I mean, you know, if we didn't have any wells or we just turned every well off, you know, for a year and redid this, would we get a, a different sort of picture? We probably would. I don't quite know what that would look like, but it would probably be a little different. Um, and certainly there would be some natural variation. So similar to kind of what we saw um, in those um, real time data, I mean, there would be some seasonal variability. It might not be as pronounced, um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly a, a lot of what we see is sort of influenced by pumping schedules and demand for demand on the system. Yeah. So one, and I was going to ask you to go into this a little bit quickly uh, on your first map when you show the profile of the aquifers. I just had a question come up about uh, if it rained, let's say it rained two inches in the woodlands. And a lot of folks that I've talked to feel like, well, that's that's refilling the aquifer. And I wanted you to go back and kind of show where the outcrops are of these aquifers and where it has to rain in certain spots or it's not going to get into the aquifer. It's going to get into the river or something. Yeah, so, um, hmm, okay, so uh, in the inset map here, um, the, the, uh, the shaded areas represent those outcrop areas. So, so as, an, as an example, um, so, so here is Montgomery County. There's really only a small portion of Northwest Montgomery County where uh, the Jasper, the outcrop of the, of the Jasper, uh, or that, that Jasper is outcropped, I should say. Um, so we only see a small portion of that within Montgomery County. Um, and then, you know, a part of Grimes County here as well. So really only um, this portion this relatively small portion of the Jasper is going to receive any sort of recharge. Um, and that's, that's sort of true for, you know, the Catahoula as well as the Chico Evangeline. Um, but, you, you know, Paul made a, a, a good, you made a good point. Um, saturation, <clears throat> excuse me, previous saturation of the sediments can play a role. So if they're, you know, as an, just as an example, if we get a big torrential rain or something, right. Um, a large part of that is just going to be uh, uh, is just going to be discharged through the streams, rivers, and bayous and streams, um, and only a small portion of that is actually going to infiltrate into the aquifer system. Um, but on top of that, you know, I kind of mentioned that this is sort of a uh, just a cons I mean, it's a simplified diagram of the cross section, but there's really a significant amount of, of clay in these systems as well, and that really impedes the flow. So really. Um, yes, there's, there's, uh, there is recharge, but it's relatively slow. It's quite slow, really. Um, and for, uh, and for water that enters the outcrop area, but again, for the Jasper, for it, for it to infiltrate and reach a level at which, um, is, uh, um, useful for wells, say in, in Montgomery County, um, it's going to take quite a bit. I mean, this is, you know, here we can kind of see. If we follow this line, you know, 1,600 to 2,000 feet, uh, maybe 1,200 to 2,000 feet, roughly. Um, it, you know, these are some of the depths that that exist for the Jasper within Montgomery County, at least at least within this particular where this cross section is. So, uh, in any case, there's there's is fairly significant amount of impediment of of, of flow to that uh, recharge, um, and they're fairly deep systems, so it just takes a while for it to get there. Um, and so and so our, our recharge rates are really rel relatively quite slow um and i think this is another thing i, I would reference uh, or, or reference to the that gulf model report there was uh, a large effort to um to incorporate some of these recharge rates uh into that model so um yeah generally recharge is, is fairly slow to the system and when you say very slow it, it can take a thousand years or so to get from up there to down here so. yeah i mean it i mean you know i i don't want to speculate specific on years but i mean it's it's it is many 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 years yeah long time yeah
think that was it. I want to, I think that's the question. I had. Oh, someone did ask about getting an extensometer data in Southern Montgomery County. And I, you may know about this. Is my understanding that one was being installed or has been installed in the Southern Montgomery County, maybe by the subsidence district and others? I'm not, I, I had heard about it. I'm not really sure the status. We're not involved with it. Um, we as the USGS are not involved with it. I think it was actually something that was initiated by Lone Star, uh, Groundwater Conservation District. Um, right. I don't know where they are in that process. Um, I, I haven't heard recently where they are with that, uh, if that's moving forward or not. Um, I think I think I, I they they were starting to go down a path. They were doing some core samples and so forth, from my understanding. Um, but uh, but they are um, specialized um, instruments. Um, really, as far as I'm aware, I don't think anybody but the USGS, at least in the United States, um, either installs exensometers or operates and maintains exensometers or collects data from them. Um, so, so they are fairly specialized. It's not quite like just putting in a water well. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I, so I, I'm not really sure where that, where that is. And, and I was well, saying they're, they're, quite, even, they're quite expensive. Yeah, That's the other. I think it's coming. It's coming if it's not here. So yeah. Yeah. Well, it'd be great uh, to have some final, data for sure. Final question, um, about whether or not we've specifically seen any I guess rebounds with the woodlands taking on Lake Conroe water. Um, I, and I also wanted to thank, I noticed there were several mud directors from the woodlands area that logged on and maybe even a township director. But, you know, I, that's something I don't want to speak to. And I don't think that, I mean, I won't speak for Jason, but I think we have to keep in mind that even though we're uh, basically trying to get to a 50-50 ratio of surface water and groundwater. Uh, it still depends on the total demand on the, like in 2011, whether it was surface or whether it was groundwater or both, the demand was much higher than it normally would be. So we saw declines, even though we were taking more surface water. So, I mean, obviously that's, though I think one of the pictures I saw uh, just the other day with a presentation from uh, the subsidence district, it's a powerful scene that, you know, now I guess it's been 20 years ago that area one that you mentioned, Galveston and Southern Houston converted. They're now limited to 10% of their demand being groundwater. And then as you move up, you can clearly see where the wells have rebounded. And as you get to Northwest Harris County, you can see them all pretty red. Yeah, yeah. So uh, all this area that is a water level rise, these are effectively yeah. areas one and two, which are now 10%, you know, groundwater. And then uh, and the, I can't you know, remember what, what the rest of area three is now, um, what they're, where they are in their, um, it's sort of a stage reduction plan. Um, so I don't quite remember offhand what the percentage is. Um, but uh, like I said, they didn't really start until about 2010. So it hasn't really been in effect for, for very long just yet. I mean, uh, with Loose Bayou and all that, I think that uh, I guess it's 2025, but you can see that the part of the Harris, North Harris County was required to start 10 years ago, and then now we're at 2025, that, that water will be taken farther west. And we hope to see the same rebound with the, with the, uh, you know, going to the surface. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think that's all we have time for. Uh, once again, I appreciate it so much. And again, thanks to mud directors for showing up. And, and I think this is highly important information and it like okay it changes year to year and uh, I think that 
uh, again, the history of it. This has been a long history of they've been doing this study for for a long time into a lot of wells, and I think it it's a tremendously important study that they do to just show us where we are. So Paul with that, Nelson, I would thank everybody for coming. Jason, thanks so much. Paul, can you hear me? Yeah, this is James Stinson. Yes, sir. Can you unmute him? Oh, now, can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Just an observation, looking at the, the Jasper and the Evangeline on the north side, north of 105 into Montgomery County and north of, north of, lost him again um, well having a problem meeting their demand i'd like to see more sample wells in that yeah I, I think you're kind of going in and out but i think you're yes i mean we've all heard some of the issues about the area that was uh growing so fast northwest montgomery um Magnolia, the, all those areas that um, we do have some subsidence monitors out that way that Lone Star operates. But I think that's more important as, as we find out that they're going to have to take more and more water to support all the growth. So, I mean, that's something that I guess Jason, you would be, at, you know, I mean, you add these as they're available. So if there are new wells, then you would be addressing them to ask if you could do the same thing that they do today everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, ideally, yeah, we'd like to add. And there's certainly areas that, you know, particularly for the Jasper, we're aware that there are areas where we're missing, uh, you know, we've got a lot of gaps in the data. So we'd like to add some more. Um, so that's that's certainly a, an effort that we, we will, uh, we, we do and we'll try to continue uh, carrying out. Well, as usual, I wanted someone mentioned that yes, uh, this will be has been recorded. And once Jason feels like the USGS has completely approved all aspects of it, and because uh, there's a lot of quality control that goes on at USGS. And once that's all done, um, he's going to release it, I assume, and we'll have the recording available for you on the Woodlands Green website. And I would ask you to spread it, number, the word to your friends, people who weren't able to attend today, that uh, they take a shot at it later. It'll be on the website. And uh, I guess, Jason, I may see you before then, but if not, I'll see you in September 25. So. That sounds good. That sounds good. Thanks so, thanks so much, everybody, for attending, and thank you, Jason, for another great. Um, yes, sir. Another yes, sir. great thank lecture. You, thank you, everybody. I appreciate.